welcome to another episode of The Core Podcast. This episode is with Lisa and I have to say it was an absolute delight to talk to Lisa. We are total strangers. We haven't really connected. It's always been online, but this has to be such a vulnerable, open conversation. She shares so much of us and the importance of security, diversity, well-being. I think this lady has so much to offer to the industry. And if at any point you've got imposter syndrome, burnout, um, not knowing how to recruit or hire or where to go, Lisa gives us so much insight. And yes, she's got an MBE and she still thinks she's got imposter syndrome. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us at The Core podcast. Um, For our audience that's listening today, would you be able to tell them a little bit more about yourself and how you've landed in the cybersecurity world? Absolutely. So my name's Lisa and I am the founder of Cybersecurity Unity, which is a global um, community organisation that I set up to try to go some small way of uniting the cybersecurity industry, not just in the UK, but on a global basis to really foster that greater collaboration, to um, stop a lot of the siloed working that we often see in cybersecurity, and and really just to have that that global community, that information sharing um, aspect. Um, I got into cybersecurity, got back in 2009, and I transitioned into cyber from the entertainment industry because um, prior to getting into cyber, I was working um, with Chris Tarrant of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, same. I did that for many years. Yes, <laughs> I do indeed. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So this is going to take yes. a ball. Right. So, I mean, I do ask this people. My question is like childhood Lisa. What did childhood yeah. Lisa want to do? What was your journey into a career? So can yeah. you explain to me like what did childhood Lisa want to do? How did she end up with Chris Tarrant and where did Cyber Absolutely. Security land? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so childhood Lisa wanted to do nothing else except write. I was always happy whenever I just had pen to paper, um, didn't really bother with um, toys or dolls or anything like, like that. But scale electrics, then you were talking. Um, I love my little cars. Um, but no, I just wanted to, to, to write. And you know, the, the, the joke sort of goes that I wasn't bothered with my toys at all. I just was happy as long as I had a pen and paper and I was, and I was writing and, and so on. So my original career choice was that I wanted to go into journalism. Okay. But I'm going to show my age a little bit now because when I um, finished studying and um, looked to where to go into journalism, it was around about the mid-90s and email wasn't really that, it was just starting to get mainstream, but it wasn't really sort of there yet at that point. And it meant making a move to London if I wanted to go into magazine journalism, which is what I wanted to do. And I just couldn't live in London for all the money in the world. It's, I don't mind going to London, but coming out of London, yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, it just wasn't for me. So I kind of, in a roundabout way, that's how I ended up working with um, Chris Tarrant, because I also got involved in doing things like I helped to ghostwrite um, one of his books at the time, which was called Tarrant Off the Record. Okay. I did a lot of his um, PR stuff, so I would liaise a lot with um you know, with, with publications for the national press and, and so on. Um, and I also got involved in a lot of his contract negotiations. So um, cap- I did his Capital Radio contract, his contract for um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and so on. Um, and I did that for, um, working with Chris quite closely for seven years at his um, management company, so quite, so quite a long time. And then I transitioned into cyber because my ex-wife, was very high up as a penetration tester, and she did a lot of government work. Um, so for the MOD, for um, uh, for Kinetic, and, and lots of um, organisations like that. And I was really fascinated by the psychology around hacking and cyber psychology and so on. Um, but there was a lot that she couldn't tell me about because she was bound by the official secrets act. But in her spare time, she founded, um, or she came up with a um, a, 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 a software testing tool um, that helped her do her day job as a penetration tester a lot, lot quicker. So the tool is called Nipper Studio and it scans routers, networks and firewalls and it looks at the configuration files uh, within various different devices and produces a detailed report of any vulnerabilities um, found. 
when she transitioned the tool from um, open source uh, to a more commercial product, it went like absolute wildfire. And she was struggling a bit in terms of just trying to keep her, her workload going as a penetration tester and everything else um, that's going on. So I, I, I joined and we founded um, the company from this very room, in, in, in fact, at the time. Um, and grew it from uh, just the two of us um, to a team of members of staff, um, offices in the center of, of, of Worcester. Um, so I really got involved in you know, a lot of the positioning of it. Um, pretty much anything that needed doing, I got on and, and did so that she could continue to sit and code because that's what she loved doing. Mm. Um, and I was also involved in the, um, in the first cyber cluster in the UK, which at the time was the Malvern cybersecurity cluster. Okay. I think there's a lot more cyber clusters yeah, yeah, under yeah. UK C C3, but Malvern under Dr. Emma Philpott, MBE, was the, the, the first one. Yeah, really? And, I also, okay. and I, I also did a lot of work as well with the cybersecurity strategy for Worcestershire, where I live in conjunction with Worcestershire County Council. Mm -hmm. um, when my ex and I... Um, separated and subsequently divorced I knew that I wanted to stay within cyber security so I then went on to do a lot of work with BT on their Assure Cyber product I then got more into the cyber security awareness training side mm -hmm. of things and I've worked with a lot of organizations um, designing different programs um, for cyber awareness over the years um, I also then founded um, the UK Cyber Security Association which is now rebranded and is now Cybersecurity Unity. So I made it much more of a community membership mm -hmm. organization as opposed to one um, as to more of a, a, a trade body. Um, I speak at events. I often get asked to write for different pu publications on different aspects of cybersecurity, um, neurodiversity, imposter syndrome, supporting women in cyber. Gosh, I could go on up to you. Know, I think it's tired. I mean, that is phenomenal. And what a beautiful story of showing that you literally don't have to have any background in cybersecurity right. entering this. I think the one thing I've really enjoyed doing this podcast and speaking to so many people is that people haven't had a natural straight path into cybersecurity. I think it will change with the next generation. But for all of us, it was something like a phenomenal that, that came around. We either accidentally fell into it or, or or went in that way. So it's incredible. And your journey is incredible to think that you were looking to do journalism and, and now now look at you. That's incredible. What a lot to digest. There's a lot of topics we can talk about. But okay, so that's fantastic. So I thought the next well, one of the things we were going to talk about was um, generation AI and cybersecurity. Um, so, in your opinion, if you were going to give a definition and a brief of what generation AI is, what is that in your opinion, and how do you think that's evolving and impacting cybersecurity? Um, absolutely. So, a lot of the generative AI tools are things like you know ChatGPT, Bard, Claude, all of those kind of kind of tools, and I think it's fair to say ChatGPT really just exploded onto the mainstream around about um, late sort of 2022. And then last year, we started to see a lot more in terms of you know, AI tools and AI being um, implemented into a lot of um, different other products and, and so on. And you get things like you know, Mid Journey, the image um, creation tools and so on. Um, but for, for me, around, around security and generative AI, some of the more traditional advice that um, I and a lot of others would tend to give around the cyber awareness piece is to if you look at phishing emails or look at emails and look at their spelling, look at how they're written, look at their grammar, things like that. And you will often spot a lot of inconsistencies um, in there, which will give you that bit of a red flag to think, yeah, that actually could be a phishing email. Mm -hmm. Don't do anything you know, with, with that. But I think the use now of chat GPT and some of these tools is making phishing emails a bit harder to, to spot because cyber criminals will often be using these tools to craft their emails. Yeah. And if you're busy or you just you just sort of skimming something and it looks OK on the surface, mm -hmm. you could very, very easily be um, you know, tricked into clicking on that, that link and then by that button, it's, it, it could be too late. Um, so that is certainly something that I've seen with generative AI is that the, the nature of phishing emails are getting 
a lot better in terms of that spelling and grammar side and harder to um, to, to spot if they're using ChatGPT and similar to craft those um, phishing emails. But there's also things like um, inherent biases and so on that AI um, has. Um, so I would always say as well, be, be really mindful about that, that information and those biases that AI will often you know, th throw out in, in the content that it, um, it generates. Um, but what I often say as well is that it's only putting out what we put in. So I always say it's sort of you know, bias in, bias out, and AI has inherited our inherent um, conscious and unconscious biases. And I, I see that quite a bit in a lot of the content that comes out. And like you said, it's what we put in. I've, I've discussed this a little bit today of going over AI with some of our other guests. How is there, is there a way of us being able to control bias? Because obviously, ultimately, uh, well, I interviewed someone recently and they were saying about how um, recruitment agency was scanning in the strongest um, CVs that they received for certain mm -hmm. roles so that AI could then go through the applicants. And I don't think they meant to, but the strongest ones they put through were all male. Yeah. So AI then learned, okay, so you, your opinion, the strongest candidates are male. And that isn't actually what they were saying. They just put the strongest ones in and it was just a default that they actually had, ended up being men. In a world where human has an, an input into AI and can create the bias, is, there, is that a bit of a danger? Can we control that? Like, is, is, is that controllable? Because, you know, I think, are we naturally biased? I think, I think for, for for me, I would never use um, that kind of AI to scan, you know, CVs or scan personal information or upload anything that could be identifiable, you yeah. know, in, in any way. But I think the gene is out of the box a bit, so to speak. And I think a lot of these programs have already inherited mm -hmm. and already been trained on exactly scenarios that you've you, you've just said. Um, so I think it's just being mindful of that whenever you're using it. And, and just being a, a bit clear on, on on those biases and, and being able to spot them and um, not relying sort of too much on the information that AI puts out. It's getting you off the blank piece of paper, but it's not necessarily yeah. accurate. Okay, yeah, that that's fair. I think a lot of people I've spoken to about AI is that it's speeding up processes and things that we could probably do ourselves, but ultimately we've still got to be in control of the narrative Absolutely. and what's getting out there. So you've mentioned phishing and you've mentioned how AI is going to improve it. I mean, I remember yeah. younger, it used to be that, I don't know, a family member was abroad and they don't have their credit card or there's a prince of something and you're about to inherit a hell of a lot of money. I mean, it's changed so much in, like, yeah. over time. Even the ones that we receive here, I get some very sophisticated ones that uh, they seem to even pick up when like, I'm on a school run. So they always seem to come through when it's aware that I'm not on my laptop, that I'm on my phone. So being able to check the source of it properly or not skim read it, I've, I've quite a few have always come through at that kind of prime time and I've picked that up. For that sophistication, how do you think we can improve awareness um, and educating individuals to protect themselves more? So I can actually give a really specific example of something that happened to me um, quite recently within the last um, couple of weeks. So I was in the process of getting a, a new car. And with that, um, insurance obviously needed to be changed, tax needed to be sorted out and a few other things. And I'd gone onto the gov.uk website and I'd gone through the whole process of taxing the new car. Mm. I'm not joking when I say within a minute, two minutes of that happening, and I got the confirmation email and everything, I also then got another email that pertained to be from gov.uk, and it actually read about your car is, 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 is not taxed and is therefore not legal. You need to click on this link to, um, to put your tax. And that came literally within two minutes of me yeah. actually taxing my car. Now, if I hadn't been that quite sort of, you know, switched on or astute about it, I could have easily have clicked on that. I mean, I didn't, but I could have quite easily have clicked on that link, thinking it was to do with the fact I'd just, not two minutes before, come off the gov.uk website to tax my, my, my car. Um, so I can easily see why people can just click on things. We're really busy. We're skimming something. 
Um, and if it does pertain to something that we've just done, like I had with, with, with the taxing of the car, it's really easy just to click on something and then get get caught out. So I think just as much awareness of, of, of all the different ways that they will try to target you as possible. The bank of mum and dad one on WhatsApp is another classic example. I don't have children, but I've had that text on numerous occasions. And it just makes me laugh because I just think, you know, I don't even have children, but you're trying to target me by saying, you know, mum, I've lost my phone. Can you send me some money? And all this kind of, yeah, this kind of thing. You know, so I, do, I just think as much awareness as, 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 as possible. And I'm going to be working on a campaign called Generation Cyber soon, which is all around we are all Generation Cyber. We all have our you know, part to play. And we're all targets in some way for, for, for cyber criminals. Um, and that campaign is going to be very much around um, looking at all these you know, different ways that hackers will target individuals and things like the WhatsApp scams, the you know, phishing emails and so on. Um, so that's a campaign I'm really looking forward to working on soon. You say generation. I mean, mm. as a child, I remember bringing stranger danger. There was a thing that we all got taught in assembly about people asking to do portraits of us. Mm -hmm. And not, not to get in the car and not to take sweets. Yeah. And, and it's such a default. I think any certain age group will just say stranger danger or roll off their tongue, not to take sweets, etc. That do you think the same emphasis needs to start being made about cyber and phishing and protection and people aren't all who you think they are on the internet mm -hmm. from such a young age? So it's just a default. So our default setting is to assume maybe that link isn't safe and that might not necessarily have come to from who you think do you think there's something in that that we're yeah. i think we trust inherently we trust and we're very trusting of a, of an authoritative thing so i know there was a big thing about covid wasn't it where text yeah. was fake and things like that and you know hmrc anything like that you know you need you owe tax or etc cetera, etc cetera. we're very uh trusting and as we sh i'd like to think as we should be as human beings in some sense. So do you think it's something that has to, from a generation, same generation, start from that early learning so it becomes more of a default? Absolutely. And I think it should be built in at school from a very young age and right through the education system. But I don't see that there's some schools that do that and do that quite well. But mm. there are a lot of others that, that, that don't. And I would love to see that sort of mainstream you know, across the board. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned yourself, Kelly, about the, uh, the the stranger danger. I'm of a certain age that I can remember all the government public information films um, back in the 1970s, um, and they and they put the fear of God into me of you know don't talk to stranger, don't do that, don't don't do that. And I and I think we've we've just started. The NCSC has just put out a campaign around um, staying safe online. But I'd really like to see a lot more sort of hard hitting um, stuff because I think. It's one of those things that until it happens to you, you don't realise the impact that it will have or how much of a target that you'll, you'll be. And I also, even, in, even now, we're in 2024, and I still talk to a lot of sole traders and small businesses, and they all will say to me, we're too small. We're not going to be, you know, a hacker's not going to bother with us. We're, mm -hmm. we, we don't need to worry about our cyber security and so on. And I just despair because I think, well, what about your supply chains, you know, and so on? Because you it's something you to, you're connected to. Yeah, yeah abso absolutely. So I think there's still a long way to go. But I really believe that unless it's something that you've had first-hand experience of or something that's happened to you, that's why it's just it's just not hitting home. So I always try to use as many real-world examples within the training that I, I provide for that reason. That makes sense because we it is difficult to make something tangible. Like even even for the big businesses and the high high up C suites, I think the CISOs of the world have the same issues. At the same trying to talk to a small business, it's the same empathy, understanding. Oh, it's not going to impact me. What's the chances of this happening? It seems a little bit, I don't know, James Bondy or movie. And until it actually happens to someone, then they're like, oh, okay. And like you said about the silos thing. I don't know about you, but I've, I mean, I've only been in the industry for nearly 10 years now, but um, the, I didn't feel like people talked about it openly. I don't think I could have done a podcast probably five years ago because when someone was hacked, it was kind of like a dirty secret. It wasn't yeah. discussed. I do think what is nice about the industry now is that people are being a bit more open 
probably been forced because people have to declare it, but people are being a bit more open because that community that you're trying to build allows people to learn from people's mistakes, potentially, or see things coming or do something differently. Absolutely. And I think as well, there's a lot less in terms of, um, I guess, the, the, the threat around, oh, am I going to lose my job if I've clicked on something or I've done something, you know, inadvertently or, or so. So I think as well, removing a lot of that in, in organisations and having that policy of being able to you know, speak up without fear or ramifications, yeah. um, because it's just so easily done you know, yeah. a lot of the time. We did. I did a great um, talk with um, a guy called Charlie, part of um, connected to the police and what they do there. And he said he found it still fascinated him that if someone had been a rape victim or or assaulted, you would uh, take them under your wing. You'd protect them. You would give them all the support, therapy, ease them back into work, all those sort of things. Um, mindful that they've been violated however we don't do the same when it becomes it's a digital thing and he said that there's the when the phishing attacks now are so sophisticated and they might have studied you gone through your facebook made you think that they're connected to you through school or your kids or anything or you maybe even got your line of trust that you feel stupid and duped and tricked and you know, and he said that that's a violation to someone that, you know, that has an impact on their mental health. Um, and yet what currently, and I don't know, you might disagree on this. Uh, what we do is kind of make shame, put an email around that this has happened and put people on training on don't make the silly mistake again. And he was like, I'm not sure you would do that to a rape victim. So why do we do it to someone that's done a phishing attack? I don't know if that if you kind of feel the same about that. No, I, I I agree, Kelly, and I think that's why I use a lot of the real world examples um, within my, my within the the training that I do that really will hit home with um, audiences because, like 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 you say, it is that sort of feeling of oh, I can't believe I was so stupid to you know, to to do that or click on that or or so on. And you're right, yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't say that you know to somebody that had been a rape or anything else. So why were we doing it within cybersecurity? I I, I don't think it's fair. No, and I I did a uh, podcast probably a year ago now about someone who was looking into the safety of people on the metaverse because she was saying that's going to come a new area where people are violated. But she was like, how do you police that when it's not a real thing? And I was like, oh, gosh, that's an even bigger, bigger minefield. You do a lot in the cyber skills and training and awareness. Do you still, we we have talked about it. I think it's a trend that's not really gone about how we're not recruiting fast enough. There's a gap. We're not attracting more talent. Obviously, you're involved in this closer to it than I am. Do you still feel like the gap's still there? And do we still have a problem with attracting talent? Yeah, I I do think the gap is still there. And a lot of the key studies, and particularly the last government studies, show that there is still um, a gap in recruiting people into the cybersecurity industry. And that's why I do a lot of work as well in terms of you know, getting more women into the cybersecurity space and those of the neurodivergent into careers into cybersecurity. Because, again, a lot of studies show that those um, that are neurodivergent are really well suited to careers in cybersecurity. And for disclosure, I myself was diagnosed with autism in 2018 and ADHD in addition to that in, um, in 2023, last year. Um, and getting that diagnosis really, you know, both of them really made such sense to me. It's like, oh, that's why I do that. And that's why I, I enjoy that. And that's why I do that. So um, that really helped in terms of understanding you know, me and why I've thrived in, in cybersecurity so much. So um, that's why I do a lot in terms of trying to you know, raise as, as much interest as possible about cybersecurity being a really cool place to, you know, to be. Because it, you know, to me, it absolutely is. And I, I live and breathe it. Um, but I will say as, as well, um, some of the feedback that I've had is that cybersecurity is a little bit unwelcoming and off-putting. Um, and it's because of the imagery, believe it or not. I've had some people say to me that um, they feel the imagery is very dark, that it's always, you know, that the, the script kid is huddled over the laptops, you know, sort of you know, doing this on their, on their keyboards. Um, it's a lot of padlocks, which gives it a very much sort of, you know, keep out and outsiders can't come in, um, you know, to, in, in terms of, of, of that imagery. So, again, I've, I've written a lot about that and, and sort of, I'm not sure how, but that needs to change, I think. And so 
and blue as well. If you notice, the default colour is, is, is blue. <laughs> I said this um, on the podcast earlier. So <laughs> I went to my first InfoSec probably maybe 10, 12 years ago. And I, from a marketing background, right, so I'm not a security background, and I've been in other industries, and I was with our CEO, James, uh, so it must have been 10, eight years ago. Um, and I've been with other people, but with him. And I remember he was like, why have you got a face like that? And I was like, I just don't understand. And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, everyone's blue. Is there like something in a contract that if you're in cybersecurity or in tech, it has to be blue? And he was like, no, but it, it's, it's, it's serious. It's a serious topic, Kelly, so it needs to be blue. I was like, okay. And I was like, why has everyone got a padlock? And he was like, well, the same reason. And I was like, okay why are all their strap lines the same because they do they all do the same thing and he was like no they all do completely different things and I was like "Mm," but it all looks the same to me and it all looks the same to me and when I started at quarter cloud everything for me was but why but why are we doing it like that why is it blue why has it got a padlock why has a guy got a hoodie on did everyone have a hoodie on that's hacking and they're like well no but everyone understands that and I was like but I don't understand that and I just remember like constantly so it's so interesting that you said the same because I came on and I got a bit of pushback when I started because it was like no this is how it's done this is why it's always been done and our branding's got bright it's got pink in it because I was like why has it got to be blue (laughs) Why is it got to be blue at all? Um, so it's interesting that you felt the same, and I and I I felt it. I felt like I didn't couldn't connect to these businesses and didn't understand the padlocks. Um, it was a lot of silhouettes of people with no faces. It was, yeah, yeah, we didn't put a person to it or a human to it. That is changing. I'm seeing a lot of people putting yeah, yeah. part of it. But when I yeah. started, yeah, I completely agree with you, and I can see why. Because from marketing, I remember when I started, a lot of my friends were like, oh god. What a dry, boring subject. Like, ooh, do you really want to go into that? And I actually think it's incredibly James Bond. It's actually yeah. a kick-ass, cool, interesting subject. Yeah. And I can see why, you know, some people might be put off by all that with you because it just give off that sort of, you know, cheap out, you know, a, a, a approach when it's really not the the, the case, you know, at, at, at all. Um, and I think it is getting a bit better. You know, there are more women coming into the space, you mm. know, now. Still not enough, but it yeah, progress is being made. So yeah, it is heartening to 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 see a, a lot of that. But there are still some things I spot from time to time that I just think, oh, really? So back in and it was 2019 when I went the last info sec I went to before the pandemic hit. Yeah. yeah. I remember on the Wednesday, I'd been there'd been a, a women in cyber sort of um breakfast sort of thing with a talk from Professor Sue, Sue Black who um, led um, Bletchley Parkinson and when that finished I came out and I started to have a look around some of the exhibition stands and at the same time I noticed a couple of trolleys full of beer and whatever being pushed along and I just thought oh perhaps they're for happy hours later or, or, or something. Anyway I came round and went across the, the stands and I thought I'm handing beers out and I looked again and I thought, they're handing the beers out to the men to draw them into the stand. Now, I deliberate, not that I wanted a beer at 10 o'clock in the morning, because I guarantee I didn't, but I made a deliberate point of walking really close by these, these stands and close by to the people that were handing the beers out. Not once was I offered a beer, but all the men were. Um. When I came back from InfoSec, I wrote about it and I posted about it on social media and I called it hashtag beer bias. And now as a result, InfoSec don't actually um, actually allow the drinks to be served on any of the stands in the exhibition until the happy hours sort of later in the day. They don't allow that now, you know, in, in, in the mornings. A lot has changed. I mean, yeah. When I started, there was some interesting ways of drawing people to a stand (laughs) that weren't necessarily cyber. I mean, they were very cleverly done Um, and people were hired in that definitely weren't. Yeah, yeah, there was. I mean, it's definitely evolved. The industry has definitely evolved. I think both of us have probably seen that change. There's some incredible women in it and I mean I've interviewed women on we did a lot before um International Women's Day of some of them having to downplay the way they looked and not wear as much makeup because people wouldn't take them seriously or 
you know, that they shouldn't look that way and, and things like that. And it's just like, oh, how could, you know, and things were have been said. And that's that's very sad, really, because like we were saying, ultimately, and I believe cybersecurity is pretty cool. We're all trying to protect and do the right thing. And everyone's experience, and this isn't women and men, this is everyone's experience of tackling a problem is different. And this is a problem that we need different people's opinions, um, ideas. A story that I was got told from one of the podcasts was, um, I think they were doing something with uh, engineering for the trains and they couldn't get the timing right. Um, and they were all male engineers. In the end, they brought a women, female engineer in and she apparently sat back for like five minutes and was like, yeah, you're getting the timing wrong because you're not thinking about people getting on the train. So they've got the system so right and so fast that they couldn't realise why this train, the trains weren't coming in on time. And it was like, well, you, you'd forgotten about the loading time. You'd forgotten about people getting on and sitting on the train. And it wasn't anything yeah. pocket science. It was just someone that went, well okay but you've not looked at it this way and you know and and I've had interesting stories about NASA and apparently they sent the first woman up to space with a hundred tampons for three weeks I mean like it's just like people's not understanding of a situation like different experiences just bring something completely completely different to it um and I think that's so important and and I'm a huge thing about the gender side and everyone will know about from the podcast of how important I think it is but also the neurodiversity interesting you saying about your autism and ADHD like I'm currently going through the process of that for myself with ADHD which has um, been a bit of a light light bulb moment I had got diagnosed with dyslexia and dyscalculia when I was 2021 um, and weirdly I didn't find that a light bulb moment um, I found that um, I don't know like I found that more that I wasn't the same as everyone else um, and I'd work so hard to be at uni and stuff like that. I don't know. It was a bit like maybe this is a whole imposter syndrome feel. Like I felt like I'd covered it up for so long. So for someone to come to me at 21, like going, oh, hang on, we've, 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 we've caught on to you. And then being told, oh, because I got given someone to come into my lectures with me to record it. And I know it's all those support mechanisms, but I felt like it made me stand out from my peers and I just wanted yeah. In. I just wanted to do well at uni I didn't want any exceptions I didn't want that and I felt like it made I don't know I just felt like it put like a spotlight on me in my last year at uni like I didn't get to do my exams with my friends I had to go in a different room all these sorts of things where the ADHD thing has been a bit of a, a light bulb moment of some of my quirks are other people have them too so that's nice it, that, that, that doesn't feel so lonely where the dyslexia dyscalculia thing felt lonely at the time this has been like, I feel like I've been finding my tribe. And interestingly, there seems to be a lot of us in cybersecurity, yeah. um, which has been incredible. Why do you think, because I'm seeing it as my superpower, my husband mm-hmm. seems to think that, you know, it's not so great because I can't get laundry done, but we're working through that. Um, <laughs> but uh, You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that is exactly the same. My husband says the same thing. It's like, you can do all this stuff during the day. Why can't you remember to turn the lights off? Why yes. can't you remember to sort the washing machine out? Yes. Why can't you remember to do the dishwasher? He follows me around like, why are your keys here and your car, your car yeah. there and your, your handbags there? And then he came into bed last night and was like, I don't know why you want to kill me, but you left your trainers at the bottom of the stairs. Like, did you just not get to the, the hall? And I was like, I don't know. I don't even know where I took them off. I was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't do it on purpose. He was like, was it a long day? I was like, yeah, it was a really long day. He was like, cool. I'm going to go watch the football. Is there anything else you've left on the stairs that I might trip on? And I was like, I don't know. Just be really careful. There could be stuff anywhere. Um, and we're in the middle of a renovation. So it's like also very dangerous with me because I'm like, oh, what's this? And tap power tool that I've taken off somewhere to hide from the kids, but put in a very unsafe place. So, But it's been a bit of a light bulb moment because like, obviously it's been a frustration for us of like, why can't I do a job? which I believe quite well and juggle loads and loads of plates. And then when it comes to home life or getting a job done or have you updated insurance or have you contacted the bank? And I'm like, oh God, I forgot. Yeah. Oh, so you. Really? I feel seen. I feel yeah. seen right now. This yeah. You've just described me to an absolute T and it's the bane of my husband's <laughs> life. He yeah. really just, yeah, he's, he's better now. And I, he, he put in a lot of smart home automations. That's been Ooh. my saving grace so he's 
So he's done, um, he, create, he coded and created a, a, a dashboard so that it's got things like, we can, and he's done all the, these smart plugs and then the routines through Alexa and so on. <gasps> so that things, so for example, if I forget the washing machine, it can just automatically turn itself off. If, <laughs> and lights can come on, we've got motion sensors so that lights will come on and off and I don't have to worry about them and things like, like that. Um, same with the dishwasher, I just press the button for the dishwasher. I can also see all our solar energy and look at all that as, as well. And the smart home automations I've, that have been fantastic for us. I call them marriage savers, literally. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, like, thank God GHDs turn themselves off now. That's all I'm saying. Um, but it's like even the door, the amount of times I've driven to work and gone, don't think I've locked the front door. And I've, I've driven all the way back and I have. I have done it. I think there's the odd occasion I haven't. But the amount of times I get to work and I'm like, mm, I'm not sure I've locked it. Not, not. And, and I, yeah. And lucky now we've got the ring doorbell so I can go back and watch myself to see if I've done it. But uh, yeah, I literally thought, I mean, up until now when someone's saying to me about, about 10 months ago, you sure you've not got ADHD? That I was like, oh. Oh, I just thought I, I thought it was a loom bit. About a year ago, I thought I was going absolutely mad because the more busy I've got at work, the home stuff was getting worse. And I, yeah, and it's like my energy, Sorry. yeah, the energy of my brain at work when I got home, like I had nothing to plug in. So the mistakes and the little things, um, I don't know why I can't leave on time for anything. The earlier I get up, that doesn't seem to help anymore either. I still leave it to the last minute. I don't know why. I don't know what's about any of that. There is a thing called time blindness because I'm the same with that. And I have to set numerous. So I even had to set an alarm for this. So I didn't forget and get yeah. sort of zoned, zoned into work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't forget that at two o'clock I've got to do this. But I set it 15 minutes before so I could yeah. just set up and check everything. And so on. so I live by alarms and I have to hear the alarms. It's no good them just, you know, or a thing coming up on the screen because I'll just click it off and I'll ignore it. I have to set actual sound alarms on my phone and they're going constantly throughout the day to remind me oh I've got a call now oh I've got that to do, to do now and, and so on so we're not shining a great light of what the things that make us kick but why do you think in a work environment actually some of our quirks I mean I believe my hyper focus I can juggle exactly. a lot of things at once. I do believe I'm a good yeah. problem solver. I actually, if an emergency happens, I'm I'm down because I can do anything in panic mode pretty well because that's my default. Um, what do you think we're missing out by not opening that? And also, I've had a conversation with before, and I don't know how you feel about this, about how we recruit people into the work because some people with different neuro neurodiversity spectrums interviewing like this could be very incredibly hard um phone calls might not work for them I don't know what were your thoughts on that yeah. of embracing people into it and how we can do that I think it's more about the realization that there's no one size fits all and a solution that works for me may not work for you and may not work for, for somebody else so again one of the things I'm looking at, at, at doing is um trying to get organizations on board with having something and this is across the board with everyone not yep. just those who are neurodivergent but my idea is to enable everyone to have um their what, what i call their workplace needs almost like a little manifesto or a list of you know it, it, hi this is lisa and these are the things that i need to do my job effectively and be the best that i can be and give as much value to the organization and, into, and, and if I can have, you know, these adjustments or these things, you know, to, to help me, I could be, you know, achieving absolutely fantastic things and a lot quicker as, as, as well and being able to, you know, hit the ground running that a lot, that, that much more, you know, quickly. So just taking me as an example, it's just things like allowing just a little bit of downtime in between calls mm -hmm. just so I can decompress and so... So just, not yeah. having back to back to back to back, you know, calls. That's the story of me. And because I'm always five minutes yeah. late to each one, it's an impact of every single one all day. Yeah. Um, because I'm always that. The next one's then 15 minutes late and the next one's 20 minutes late just because I start off yeah. five minutes or, you know, don't make the foot. No, I completely get that. Or even just remembering and to do break in. That's it. And another thing for, um, for, for me is I'm better with things sort of written. So I could be on a call and there could be some instructions or tasks or things that are said 
But mm. I always like to try and record those calls so I can refer back and I have to write down the actions because if I don't, I, I might miss. I, that. Something. I always feel like I'm a bit rude because if I'm on a call, I'm having to type at the same time. I have to write yeah. the actions or have the email open as yeah. it's happening so I'm doing the actions. Otherwise, I could come back to it the next day and be like, oh, God, I know you said something. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely emphasise em- size with that one like if I'm not okay. doing it in real time and trying to get into it I can get myself a bit lost into what my actions are so that makes sense and then even when it comes to yeah recruitment if you're conducting your videos so, uh, your interviews sorry over uh, video calls so yeah zoom teams etc um one of the things that I, so I I saw this a few months ago I thought God, this is such a simple thing, but it could be such a game changer. Mm. If you're conducting your interviews on a video call like like this, pop each question in the chat as you're going along Mm. so that not only are you getting that question said to you, you've got it there in writing in, in, in front of you. So there's less chance of you mishearing it, not understanding the question, not understanding what the requirements or the answers are. And I just thought, you know, what a game changer. It's so simple. You've got the chat on Teams, on Google Meet, on Zoom, just to put those questions in. That that really could be a game changer to a lot of people. And sometimes the ability to allow them to read it allows them to breathe. Yeah. I know with me, my bad default is that I've tried to finish people's sentences or think I can finish someone's sentence because my brain's going, it's going too fast. Um, so actually the talking to me and then saying oh if you've seen you know it's in the chat if you want to reread it allows that person to breathe you know take a step before they rush into an answer um because I just feel like with me I'm always like wanting to show so much so quick oh I know the answer blah, 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 and actually can be to my deficit because then I over chat or or go off tangent and things like that so I think yeah for different reasons making sure that they can understand it but it's also giving them a pace to the interview yeah. um for you Absolutely. to go through that Obviously, tech is, and actually, I think all industries, I think actually the more switched on we are, the more connected we are, the Slack to the Teams, to the WhatsApp, to the Signal, to the email messaging, to LinkedIn, so many ways of getting hold of. We even had this conversation with me today of I'm not keeping on top of emails. Do we have to put something in my email signature saying I respond on these times and if it's urgent, Mm -hmm. ring me because I'm getting to an email like four days later and deadlines passed of what they wanted from me. Um. We know in um, cyber burnout's pretty high. Um, yeah. I think it's actually higher in women slightly, but definitely anyone with a um, high up job um, is always on. Obviously, we're tackling problems. It's quite a serious topic. Um, do you think we are acknowledging the burnout in industry? Um, and do you think we're tackling it well? And do you think there is an effective way to manage stress? And whether that's in tech or across the board, I think I've I've done a lot in terms of talking about managing mental health, stress, and burnout in cybersecurity. All of which is is really prevalent, and we are losing some really good people. I think to um, to, to stress and burnout. Um, I think again, I would look at it from the point of view of there's no sort of one size you know fits all, but. I think just acknowledging the signs or, or looking for, for, for the signs that, that, that people could be um, impacted by it, um, especially if they're sort of disengaging a bit or they're not you know, sociable or they're not just their, their usual selves. Is that um, or, or so a trigger on. or a sign that they're not, it, that they're recoiling? Is that, would you say, like, if, as obviously I manage a team, what would you say is yeah. the best thing for me to look out for? Um, it could potentially be. I mean, I know for myself, if I'm getting very overwhelmed or I'm heading to that sort of stage, I'm, I, I try to sort of duck out of calls or I try not to be as, you know, I'm not as again. And, and that's when I know, hang on, I'm starting to get a little bit, you know, I need some time out or I need that, that space or, or things like, like that. Um, I'm, and I'm really open with everyone I work with on, on yeah. that front. But I'm normally sick. So, I'm normally <laughs> ill for like three days. It's normally like I start recoiling and then in the evenings I can't really move. And then normally I'll get hit by some horrific cold. Like my body will default, take me out for three days and then I'm back to it. But yeah, I I think I'm, I don't, yeah, I get what you mean. Like the energy of being able to give to people becomes less and you do want to do less meetings or 
get other people to pick up some of the tasks for you because you're like, oh, I can't handle that today. And I get that. And I was, and I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia um, in April 2022. Oh, so oh. I always know when I'm heading um, for a fibromyalgia flare-up because... I, I feel I like you're my twin sister. So are we in my family, female women, we have fibromyalgia. So I, I, my grandma, my, my um, aunt has it really bad. Um, and my mum has it, but she she coped with it. And um, uh, last year I started looking into my health and my diet and stuff because it was flaring up a lot in my shoulders and in my in my um, uh, hands and wrists. And a lot can be done can be triggered due to your mental health, your diet, exercising, and stuff. Yeah. So, ah, oh, interesting that you got you have that too. Oh, Absolutely, but mine is the result of a lifetime of bullying and abuse that I've been subjected to in every single area. So as far back as even before I started school from certain family members, right up to when I walked through the school gates, naively I got to 16 years old and I thought, I can't wait to leave this school because that's it, the the bullying will be started. Oh no, it was far worse in college. It's been incredible in various workplaces. I have literally left workplaces over the years where I've been subjected to it. And as recently, I left um, an organisation in um, May 2022, and it's an organisation that's government backed and should know better because I was subjected um, to a lot of significant bullying abuse and gender pay gap there as well. Yeah. When I found out, because I'd, I'd been offered a head of um, role there, and I was told that it came with a 5K salary increase. Um, but in real terms, it was only a one case salary increase because at the time I really believed in the organisation. So I'd taken a slight drop to go there. So I'm like, in real terms, it's one case. That's, that's nothing. Mm. I then found out that a male counterpart had also been offered a head of equivalent level role at 15,000 more than me. So I left. Wow. So it, re- it does happen. It really does still happen. Are you saying that your yeah. um your like the child and the experiences have escalated your fibromyalgia, or that's I'd say, I would say I I yes I would say so. it's not just the experiences it's the bullying and abuse throughout my lifetime, but mm. I also had a huge um, trauma that I went through in 2013 because my only son was stillborn, um, and I didn't have any before him, and I didn't have go on to have any after him as well so that impacted me and still does completely you know, took, me, took me from sideways and expect you to say that oh so sorry oh, sorry i'm very lucky i have two very healthy children i can't imagine going through that sorry so all of all of that is just yeah it's it really yeah. impacted in terms of um, developing fibromyalgia yeah, I mean, I I haven't really looked much into it. I just know that um, the, the females in my line have got it. And um, just with like, oh, yeah, I've seen how it's impacted family members. And I just was like, didn't want. And from like um, late 30s, 40s, going into menopause, it got much worse. So obviously yeah. in where I'm going in my age life, I was like, that's not really like my kids are important. Like my career is important. I want to be doing that for as long as possible. So I just started looking into it. But I hadn't realized like, how the other traumas and stuff like that could escalate or impact it so this podcast teaches you a lot (laughs) there's a there's a book called the body keeps the score that i highly recommend that goes into the significant link between traumatic events and the development of physical um conditions such as fibromyalgia and autoimmune illnesses as, as as well a lot of autoimmune illnesses, like fibromyalgia, can also be linked to significant um, trauma. So definitely The Body Keeps the Score. It's a really good book. I will definitely get that and read that. The last kind of topic that I wanted to go with you before I start crying and getting emotional was the uh, imposter syndrome. Um, and I feel like we all suffer from it whether us women are more open about talking about it I don't know but I do think everyone suffers from it um how what's your understanding of it and what's your training mechanisms for combating this because I also think I've read some interesting stats about how women will only apply for a job that they're 90% qualified for men are 60% whether that's 
factually perfect anymore. I'm not sure. But um, is that a bit of an imposter syndrome thing? Is that us holding our own way back? Like, what do you think of your, um, yeah, what is your thoughts on that? So I can talk about from my own experience, everything I've ever done throughout my lifetime has always, always been met with this thing in my head of this wasn't meant for me. I'm not good enough, you know, for this. I shouldn't go for that that role. I'm not good enough. I shouldn't do that. I'm not good enough. Um, and if I do, I remember even as far back as I remember when I first started working with Chris Tarrant, in the back of my mind all the time was, I shouldn't be here doing this. I'm a complete fraud and I'm going to get found out at any second. And that's how it manifests itself with me. And you mentioned about the, the, the not applying for, for things. That was exactly me. If I didn't hit all the criteria straight away, I just think, forget it. I'm not even going to um, bother going, going for it, even though I knew I could do it hands down. Mm. So that's you know, certainly how imposter syndrome manifested itself um, with, with me. And um, what was really interesting for, for me is when I started delving into it and I realized that it actually had a, a name that it was a real phenomenon and I wasn't just you know, going crazy thinking about it. I started to do a lot of research into it and came across a lot of high profile people that also said they suffer from imposter syndrome. You know, people like the poet um, Maya Angelou, um, for example, um, even Barack Obama's um, been on record as saying he suffers from imposter syndrome. But the biggest one for me is I'm a huge, huge fan of the rock band Queen and Freddie Mercury. Yep. I just love, love, love Freddie to this day. And I remember reading about Freddie and thinking, gosh, he had it as, as well. And the story would go that he would, before every single live concert that Queen did, he would often be so, so you know, nervous. He would be physically sick before a gig, before he would go out on stage. And then he would go out, he'd do the, you know, the most amazing performances. And then he would come off stage and go to the rest of the band. Oh, was I all right, darlings? Do you think that they liked me? And I'm just thinking... But this is the guy that had a million people in the palm of his hand in that iconic Live Aid mm. performance back in, in 1985. You know, so I thought, gosh, if somebody like Freddie Mercury can do it, like you say, I think we all can you know, suffer from it to, to some degree. So um, I see a lot about, you know, conquering imposter syndrome and so on, but I actually prefer to say you can learn to manage it because I think it's something that never goes away. I don't think it's something you can fully ever, you know, say is, is gone. But I think I prefer to come at it from sort of managing it. So, you know, for me, I, I love doing um, crafting and bullet journaling and things like that. So I have a success journal and I write down everything that I, I do and you know, all, the, all the little things and so on. And some days, Kelly, that could be, you know, my success could be, I got out of bed today and that, and I will write that down today. I got out of bed. And some days, you know, I'll, I'll like that, that I just have to really sort of, you know, push myself to get up, get going and, and get started and, and and so on. Um, but I note down all those little successes, you know, no, no matter how small. And the biggest amount of imposter syndrome that I had was when I received a letter um, telling me that I'd been awarded an MBA for services. To I was going to say, you haven't, you haven't, you've subtly gone over that, but you have an MBA. Yeah, I, yeah, I, because I really feel even now that it wasn't meant for me, that the honours committee got it wrong, that it was meant for somebody else and so on. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not very good at sort of saying about it and I try to just not, yeah, but it, it, it's true. I, I have a, I have an MBA. Um, and even when I was in front of the king and the, and the king to put it on and had a little chat with him, I was like, this wasn't meant for me. This wasn't meant for me. This was meant for somebody else. So yeah, that's how um, deep seated it, it it is. <laughs> I can't even imagine being like that letter for you. It's been phenomenal. I think for my coping mechanism for it, I mean, I I journal. That's a thing that I do too. But um, is that it's kind of reassuring that everyone has it. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter to what peak they get to, they've all got it. Everyone's winging it. I mean no one really knows like everyone's journey is totally different um you know like I've, I've spoken to recent people you know trying to get to know more people like CMOs and myself and my position so I can learn off them and stuff like that and what's been really reassuring was when you meet them all of them are the same and battling the same 
problems and things that you think you're good at that they're worried that they're not and and vice versa and you're kind of all on that that same journey and what are you benchmarking yourself against it's just self isn't it so I just and and I think I don't know if it's a maturity thing or as you get older I don't know if I feel like going into my 30s and my 40s that I know myself far more than I did in my 20s and the things that I worried about then that I couldn't achieve it's just like well now like would 20 year old self now be like thinking she's a director of her own company and running a podcast and in a cyber security like she would have been like absolutely not but I think you you get in your own way but I think if you realize that everyone else has got imposter syndrome not everyone knows the answers even the people that have done it before you don't always know the answers because they're the landscape's always changing, right? Like the best CMOs from 20 years ago would be in a different environment than I am in t- today, right? It, it's just their journey. And I, that kind of takes the pressure off me a little bit when I'm like, it's kind of like when they say that you, if you're acting on stage, you should imagine everyone's naked because we're all yeah. the same. It's kind of that, it kind of levels the playing field for me a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've also done a lot of research and found that those that are neurodivergent are more likely to suffer from imposter syndrome yeah I've heard that too that we beat ourselves up way more yeah. in the FOMO thing um because I also stopped drinking a year ago um because I realized how much that escalated I mean I'm like even if it's just like a couple of glasses of you know wine or something at dinner the next morning or that evening I'd be like beating myself up of everything I said did I over talk did I say the wrong thing did I irritate someone um not that they're not a drinking belt. The brain still talks like that all the time. But again, like, you know, when you get diagnosed and go through all these steps of what you do, it was a bit like a, oh, eureka moment of like, okay, yeah. other people do it too. It's not just my crazy chimp in my head. Another little correlation I found in the research that I did was around um, increased levels of imposter syndrome If you've been subjected to narcissistic abuse, and I've done a lot of research into narcissism and narcissistic personality types, um, not just in the workplace, but in other areas of life as well, and how that personality type impacts um, on other people. And interestingly, I get asked um, by a lot of people of, how can you deal with that type of, of, of personality in the workplace and, and, and so on? And the only advice that I can give is find is, is do your absolute best to find another job and get out as soon as possible because narcissists do not change. They just they they just don't. Even if they say that they, they do, they might be able to mask it for a little bit, but then they'll go back to their, their true selves and also when I look now at all those that bullied and abused me, I can see hands down the red flags that they had narcissistic personality traits or even the full-blown narcissistic personality disorder. Oh. How do you identify that, though, when you're interviewing for a yeah. job? So I just I look at the person and if it's all about them and they're not really asking you a lot of questions about you or taking a real interest in you or they're they're talking about the, the company or about them or it's it's always what I call that sort of me 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 or you're talking to somebody and you'll say something that's happened to you and they've had some they've had it but they've had it far worse than than you or that you ever you know imagine so never mind about you but this is what happened to me and it's always you know a, a big drama or a lot worse or or, or so on and I can spot that now, sort of hands down, whereas I, I couldn't before. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, I can, I definitely can relate to the bigger. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> there's a few, few jokes of people that I've met, but you know, like my classic one is like, you know, if you've been like horse riding, they've they've rode on a unicorn. Yeah, like, kind of yeah. like oh, okay. exactly that. I yeah. Got, oh, yeah, I've been to Tenerife. Well, I've been on a Tenerife, Arifia. Oh, okay, cool. Got you cloudy. Yeah, no, I get it. No, and, and that's, I guess, wrapping up the conversation about talent and training and it's having the right place, the right environment, the right people. And if you are interviewing or looking into going to a new sector, I think cybersecurity is a fantastic sector for Absolutely. new gender making decisions ignore the padlocks like that's just purely done badly by marketing um it is a warm there are incredible people like 
this relation this connection here right through linkedin and having a wonderful conversation with you like it's it's there and people are there and it's a great place to be you and have your quirks and and bring that to life in a problem solving environment and that's why we're doing these podcasts to encourage as many people to join the cybersecurity industry um but I, yeah, what you're saying with that of being in the right environment, I think it's very intelligent of like when you're doing an interview, it's two way, isn't it? It's not just them interviewing yeah. you. You have to interview them of whether Absolutely. That's- yeah. And I've gone into things in the past, totally ignoring those, you know, red flags and, and so on. And as I said, as recently as um, 2021, 2022, but now I won't do that again. I will always look and sort of go, yeah, if that doesn't sit right or that doesn't feel right or yeah i'll give it a wide burst <laughs> that makes sense yeah. lisa it's been an hour i think i could probably talk to you for far longer but you are getting a new car today so yeah might turn up any minute lisa if you were to encourage anyone to join the cyber security just to end the podcast what mm. would you, why would you suggest joining our industry I- I just think the sheer variety of everything that goes on and everyone is supportive. I mean, like in every industry, you are going to get those that that are bullies and so on. I've come across a, a few of them. Um, but overall, it's really not like that. And, you know, I would really encourage anybody to consider cybersecurity as a career choice. You'll get to do a lot of really cool things and meet a lot of great people. Um, and it's a really nice, welcoming and open community. Oh. Well, I don't think there's many episodes that I cry on, but that definitely, definitely caught me off guard today. Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time, being so open, honest, transparent, vulnerable with me. It was really lovely. And thank you for giving your insights and that this industry isn't all about padlocks. And that is so true. Um, Great recommendations of some books. I think there's some things that I definitely need to look into um so thank you so much for that um for anyone that wants to connect with lisa please do on linkedin she runs a lot of training courses and things like that that as you can see she is fantastic in her field um yeah what what a great way to connect with someone and learn more some about someone and there's just another reason why i love this industry and it's open to so many different personalities and backgrounds and yeah why what a great place for us to solve a big problem but with some incredible people it's just a great network so do feel like i'm finding my tribe on this place how amazing so again thank you so much for joining me um i do hope you can listen to more episodes of the cord podcast and please do let me know give you your feedback who would you like to join um daniel looks after the podcast please connect with him he would love to have you and i'm really pushing for going on a road trip so if you want to come and visit us or we want to come and visit you why don't you just pop in the messages connect with us on our um, page on the website or please direct message me on linkedin once again thank you for joining us on the cord podcast and i look forward to speaking to you soon